Yeah, welcome everybody to um, today's um, first for this year CMES lecture on the ancient site. Thank you all for um, coming on this Friday afternoon and thanks to Professor Klein for um, giving this um, lecture. And now I'm going to hand it over to John Melling, our second year um, CMES student who really organized this um, on behalf of the MESA board. And yeah, John. Thank you, Professor Paulus. Um, thank you all so much for coming out today. Um, and uh, on behalf of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies here at the University of Chicago, I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Eric Klein. Professor Klein will be discussing with us today the findings from the excavation of a Middle Bronze Age Canaanite palace at Tel Kavri, Israel. The palace is at least three times larger than previously thought and contains Aegean frescoes, the oldest and largest wine cellar known from the ancient Near East and most recently, evidence of a catastrophic earthquake. Eric Klein is a professor of classics, history, and anthropology, the former chair of the Department of Classical and Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, and the current director of the Capital Archaeological Institute at George Washington University. Some of his many achievements include being named a National Geographic Explorer, NEH Public Scholar, Getty Scholar, and a Fulbright Scholar all while finding the time and energy to successfully publish 30 books and almost 100 articles. Professor Klein is a seasoned archaeologist with over 30 seasons of excavation and survey experience to date, and is currently serving as co-director of the excavation at Tel Kavri. If you would like to learn more about the previous seasons at Tel Kavri, Professor Klein has co-edited a volume of the series Culture and History of the Ancient Near East, titled Excavations at Tel Kavri, the 2005 to 2011 seasons, and it is currently available on Brill. Now, please join me in welcoming Professor Eric Klein. Thank you so much for having me here today and for inviting me. And thank you to all for attending and taking a part out of your day to join me. Um, and it's good to see some people I know in the audience and a lot that I don't know. So uh, thank you for coming again. Um, what I'm going to do today is basically walk you through what we've been doing at Fabri since 2005. And I'm going to uh, assume no previous knowledge, let's put it that way. Um, though I know there are some people in the audience that could probably be giving this lecture rather than me. Um, and I propose to basically run through it chronologically in terms of our seasons of excavation and show you what we found each season, uh, leaving enough time for uh, questions and answers at the end during um, at which point we can go more into depth if you would like. So uh, let me run through everything first and then open it up to questions. So uh, we're starting here with an overview of what the site looks like in terms of where we've excavated. It is rather unusual in terms of being in the midst of an avocado grove. So I've never dug in an avocado grove before. It's rather interesting. Uh, unfortunately, we're there usually June and July and the avocados do not ripen until January. So we don't get the benefit, but nevertheless, we do get the shade. So just to show you where we are, Cabri is over here. It's where the yellow thumb pin is. It's in the very north of what is now uh, Israel, ancient Canaan. We are, in fact, just a couple of kilometers from the border with Lebanon. And I wanted to show you this in terms of its relationship, especially over to mainland Greece and Crete and the Cycladic Islands, because we will come back to that in just a moment. But in terms of being in Israel itself, you can see here I've got Jerusalem on the map, and then Kabri. We are about 30 kilometers north of Haifa. We're just north of Akko and Naharia, if you know that region. The actual site, we've um, been excavating what really is the third largest site in the region. Hatsor is bigger than us, uh, and Ashkelon is bigger than us, but Kabri comes in third in the region. Um, when we started digging there, we had thought the dates were about 1800 down to 1600 or 1500. 
our radiocarbon dates are now telling us that we are older than we thought. So we have pushed the dates back and it looks like probably uh, at least the parts in the palace that we've been digging start in about 1900 BCE and then it all collapses by about 1700 BCE. So you can see the mound here, uh, the oval shape dictated but by what looked like a glassy fortification at some point. Two water sources, one on top of the mound and one just off of the mound to the right there. <clears throat> and then the road going right through the middle, which is the British Mandate Road. So this is what it looks like in a schematic drawing. You can see the, um, the road coming through here uh, and then one pool and a second pool. It's about 30 hectares or 75 acres all told. And occupation really seems to start in the pottery Neolithic period, but it is the Middle Bronze Age that is the major period. It's essentially a one period site. There's a little bit of Iron Age, there's a little bit of uh, Ottoman and Byzantine. Uh, there is, as I say, uh, some Neolithic scattered around the edges, but basically it's um, specifically Middle Bronze Age. There is also a little early Bronze Age. So we've been lucky in digging that wherever we put down our squares, we essentially come straight down on the Middle Bronze Age. Now, we're not the first to have excavated at the site. The um, primary excavators before us were Aaron Kempinski uh, and Wolf Dietrich Niemeyer. They were there from 1986 until 1993. And it was during their excavations that what you see here was revealed, everything uh, in black and then the grid area with bits and pieces from the other rooms of this palace. Uh, and they dated it to Middle Bronze Age, which was quite right, and said that it covered about 2,000 square meters. We now know that that was an underestimate. The palace is at least twice that size, if not three times that size or more. It is, as we call it, the palace that keeps on giving. So we think it's at least 6,000 square meters, maybe eight and possibly even more than that because we see no end in sight, north, south, east, or west. We haven't hit any of the outer walls of the palace yet. So this is a general view of area D where Kempinski and Niemeyer were digging in the late 80s, early 90s. And what really brought this site to the attention of the world was that in 1989, they discovered a painted floor, um, which has a Gian style painting on it. And these pictures were sent to me courtesy of Linda Myberg, who was excavating there at that time. And you can actually see in uh, the pictures that they are not wearing shoes or socks. They took everything off to preserve the painting. And in fact, my co-director, Asafia Sorlando, who has lectured uh, at Chicago on Cabri previously a couple of seasons ago, uh, he actually was a volunteer at the dig. I think it was back in 1990 and always said he wanted to come back and dig there himself, which is what we're now doing. So it was this painted floor in uh, Aegean style motifs that uh, brought it to everyone's attention, including myself. Uh, in 1989, I was still working on my dissertation uh, and I was very interested in studying international connections between Greece and the Near East, including Egypt. So at the time I was at University of Pennsylvania studying with Jim Muley. And so when this was announced in 89, I was very, very excited. Hence my interest when Asaf asked me uh, in 2004, if I wanted to join him to reopen the site, I enthusiastically said yes. So this is what the floor looks like here. It is in black and white on the left, artist rendition on the right. And you can see the red string lines, which are made in a Minoan manner, generally accepted dipping a string into red paint and then pulling it tight against the plaster of the floor, thereby creating a straight line. And then the flowers inside, irises, locuses, things like that, which one would normally see in places like the palace 
at Knossos or Mycenaean palaces on the mainland. So here is one of the shots from Tabri volume one that Kempinski put out in 2002. It was posthumous after his death because he died in 1994. This is why the site was available for us to reopen it. Uh, and you can see here, I, you can see, yes, some of the lines and barely make out some of the flowers there. In addition to that floor, they also found broken up and used as packing underneath a threshold leading into ceremonial hall 611, which is where that floor was. They also found broken up um, pieces, 2000 pieces of what looks to be a miniature style fresco or frescoes. And you can see the various pictures uh, right here. And um, Barman Niemeyer in particular, Wolf Dietrich's um, wife, uh, is a specialist in trying to put these together. And so based on the paintings at Akrotiri on Santorini, she tried to piece some of these together. But as you can see, they're very fragmentary and hard to tell. So the uh, initial identifications were that these were Minoan style paintings, but we actually think that since you have to pull Akrotiri into the mix, that it's better to call them Aegean style paintings. Now, we're not the only site in the Eastern Mediterranean or Egypt to have such paintings. There are three other sites dating to between 1700 and 1400 that also have Aegean style paintings, and I'm sure they're familiar to many of you, uh, Alalak, Katna, and Daba, plus us at Kabri are the four. So Dabra has the famous bull leaping frescoes. Uh, Alalak has what may be a bull's head um, uh, Bukrania double, um, double sided ax, though these have been recently called into question and uh, reassembled in a different way. And then Katna in uh, modern day Syria has yielded uh, frescoes that are a bit later than the rest. They're down in about 1400 BCE, and they were the only ones that were still up on the wall. They've got one really cute one with turtles and another one which they have reconstructed to be a dolphin. So we do have company, though now with our redating, we are wondering if we are might not be the earliest of the four. And in fact, the new radiocarbon dating, which Felix Hoffemeyer has been doing, may indicate that we are earlier even than the ones on Akrotiri, which has given us pause for thought because when Woolley was excavating at Alalak in the 1920s, he suggested that such painting went from the Eastern Mediterranean to the Aegean. Over the years that had been abandoned, but now we're wondering if we really are earlier that maybe he might not have been correct. So. This is something that we and others need to look into. The other question is simply who is doing these paintings? Um, it's been suggested that roving craftsmen might have made them, itinerant artists. We see, for example, in uh, Near Eastern texts at various times that um, kings are exchanging sculptors and artists and musicians and the like. So is this what we have here? Or is it part of the international trade and exchange that was going on at about this time? So these were questions that uh, both Asaf and I were interested in answering, and this is in part why we wanted to reopen the excavations. <clears throat> so we start in um, we start in in 2003 when Asaf was finishing up his dissertation, and he went up with a friend of his. Uh, from I think it was the either geophysics or geology department at Tel Aviv. And they came up here to do some remote sensing. You can see in the purple and blue uh, conductivity study they did. And then the kind of amoeba looking thing on the right is their magnetometer results. Magnetometer didn't tell them much, but the conductivity seemed to indicate that there were additional walls that were down here to the south of where Niemeyer and Kempinski had excavated. And so that's when Asaf and I met up, we was at a conference in Atlanta in 2004. 
And he showed me the results and said, you want to join in uh, and reopen the excavations? I said, absolutely, that would be great. Uh, and so we did it in alternating years, starting in 2005. So here's where we put down our excavations, whereas in 2005, you can see the light blue is our three areas. Uh, and we are just to the south of 611, which is what you see over here in the picture. The floor itself has been covered over to protect it. That's what Kempinski and Niemeyer had done. So there's actually volcanic tufa uh, that is on top of the floor. So when we started excavating, it was quite uh, the experience, I would say, uh, like nothing else that's um, ever happened to me. I can uh, let you in on uh, what happened. We had enough money for four weeks to um, check to see if the um, remote sensing was correct. Basically, we went to do ground truthing. And when we started digging, there was, we found absolutely nothing. First day, second day, third day. And, you know, usually when we say we find nothing, we're still finding, right, buckets worth of, of thirds and all that. But in this case, we are actually finding nothing. We would come home at the end of the digging day and send the volunteers off to go swimming at the pool because there was literally nothing to do. And that went on for about 10 days. Uh, and we had only, you know, we only had money for a total of 20. But on about the 10th day, a member of the kibbutz came down and said, how deep are you? And we said, oh, we're, um, I, I would say we're about, yeah, what was it exactly? We were about five and a half feet down, I think I would say. Um, and he said, okay, you should probably hit something tomorrow. And we looked at him, we said, tomorrow, we're gonna hit something? Uh, are you an archeologist? He said, um, no, I'm a member of the kibbutz. And when we planted the avocado trees, we brought in six feet of earth. So you're almost through that six feet. You should hit something tomorrow. <laughs> sure enough, the next day, we hit plaster floors, we hit walls, uh, we hit everything. And it turned out what the, what the remote sensing had showed us though, was that there was stuff, but it hadn't told us how far down it was. So I learned a valuable lesson that day, which is to talk to the locals before you start digging and find out if anything has happened at the site that might impact you. Uh, and I would um, definitely call that a rookie mistake. So anyway, the good news was we then spent the next 10 days excavating and found things like this Cypriot sturd that was on a destruction level on the floor. So we were already able to start um, dating it. And then we went through the floor in one place because it was patchy. Lo and behold, there was an earlier wall. So we knew that there were a number of phases to the uh, palace and that we would be able to come back. Uh, and indeed, in all of our various uh, squares, that was when we realized that it was larger uh, than they had estimated. And we thought at that time, somewhere between three and 4,000 um, square meters. And we also realized that uh, at the time, nobody else was excavating the Canaanite palace. So we wanted to look at things like their lifestyle, um, the rise of rulership, things like that in the region. But before we actually started digging, we wanted to put it into context. So we spent 2006 and 2007 doing a survey of the area. We were fortunate in that this area has been heavily surveyed already for the last three decades or more in all seasons, summer, winter, spring, fall. So we actually did a targeted survey going back to the sites where previous surveys had identified Middle Bronze Age remains. And we were able to, uh, in some cases, go back uh, and re-estimate the size with uh, GIS and GPS and all of that. And we're able to create the map that you see here that George Pierce put together. And you can see the Triangle of Cabri, but also there are other sites that are worth excavating at some point, including over here at the Ilya, which um, uh, is right for someone to go and excavate and find out what's happening there in Middle Bronze. So we then, after the survey in 2006 and seven, we came back uh, for another preliminary season in 2008 to figure out what we wanted to do, what we were gonna explore. 
And that particular season with a small team, uh, we were able to get the stratigraphy in one area uh, and realized that the palace had gone through uh, about four iterations, four different phases. We also found, you can see in the lower left here, uh, there was a, um, a burial underneath a house that was there before the palace was built. So obviously, whoever built the palace um, uh, appropriated some land and uh, so there had been a, a house there with a burial and uh, we nicknamed him Kenny. We, he was Kenny the Canaanite. And so our theme for that 2008 season was uh, who killed Kenny? Since a lot of us had grown up watching South Park. So um, that was a very, very useful season. Um, and in fact, we had Laura D'Alessandro from the Oriental Institute come over and help us out excavating some of the um, unpainted uh, fresco fragments that we found that season. But then we really began um, in 2009 with our first large team. Uh, we had two areas of excavation. Over here, the upper left area, D west, as we call it, is where um, the ceremony hall 611 had been with the painted floor and with the fragments underneath one of the thresholds. And then we also opened up on the other side of that British Mandate Road, the area that we called Area D South. Uh, and it was in that latter area, in D South, in um, a very small building that we found more fragments uh, of painted plaster, uh, which you can see here. This is actually one fragment but it had left part of its paint in the dirt when it was flipped over. Uh, and that actually happened in a number of cases, even when we had conservators come up to help us get them out, um, still the paint adhered in a number of cases. And it turned out that all of the fragments we found in that area had been deliberately placed face down so that the colored part was um, down, and the white backing was face up. And we were a bit confused uh, by this for a while because it seemed so deliberate. And indeed, it seems that it was. There is, in fact, a parallel at the Palace of Pylos over on mainland Greece, where um, broken up and reused plaster fragments are, um, are used in the same way. And they are used to patch the white plaster floor. So if you put the colored um, face face down, then you've got the white at the back and you can patch your plaster floor. So we're wondering if maybe we don't have the same sort of technique here where they're reusing uh, fresco fragments that they've taken off the wall to patch their floor. So it remains a hypothesis. But that season in 2009, we found something like 100 fragments of uh, plaster of which 60 or thereabout were painted. And we had all sorts of different colors. You can see uh, part of the spectrum here, yellow, orange, red, black. Uh, and we also had blue. It's as far as I know, the first color blue found in um, the region of Israel. And um, we actually had a little bit of a problem, which you can see in the top left here. It's a bit of a, um, an optical illusion insofar as is that a blue object against a white background, or is it something white in the foreground and blue in the background? And that's actually um, what I would opt for is the blue being the background. But we had some heated discussions at the beginning when we first found these. Uh, and you can see again, some of those that came up. This was the largest set of joining pieces that uh, we found. These are all my pictures. I was the photographer. These are my pictures about, I would say 90 seconds after we found them. So they're still wet from the, uh, the soil. But the question that we had is, which way do these face? So that was one possibility. But later when they uh, dried out and another piece or two 
was added to them and uh, additional photographs were taken back in the lab, we thought maybe they went the other way. So if in fact they go one way, the original way I had them, as you can see in the lower left, they would match the fins of the flying fish that you see on the fresco at Philacopi on Milos in the Cyclades. But if they go the other way, as you see in the upper right hand, they match this wing of a griffin that was found at Mycenae. Now this is a little bit later, it dates to about 1400 BC, so it's going to be 400 years or so later than ours, give or take. But still, um, we don't know which way our um, fresco fragments go. So either a flying fish fin or um, wing of a, of a griffin, or it could be others. It could be some people have suggested fronds from a palm tree. Some have suggested a very stylized hand. Um, but I kind of like this griffin because I think uh, we've got the wing up top here, but just below this part where my arrow is, hopefully you can see it, I think is actually the back part with the rump and the tail coming out. And then this third piece may be part of like the front joint of the leg. So I think I can see bits and pieces of the griffin, but again, um, completely open to uh, different reinterpretations. So that was the highlight of 2009 were those fresco fragments. When we came back in 2011, uh, we continued excavating in the same two areas. Here you can see on the right, D South, and that building there, that's where those <clears throat> plaster fragments came from. You can actually see the white plaster floor there. But we also went up here uh, back to our area D West. And again, you see Ceremonial Hall 611 right in the middle there. So down in D South, we found a couple more uh, additional fresco fragments, again, with the blue and the white. This shows you how hard it was to excavate because these were actually uh, being excavated by the conservator, <clears throat> excuse me, by the conservator that we brought to the site. Uh, and even they had trouble getting them out intact. We also though, uh, found in that same area, this uh, intermediate period scarab, which uh, Daphne Bantor tells us is actually a local imitation, but it should give us a date of somewhere in this region, 1650 or so, um, which is something then that we have to correlate with the radiocarbon dates that we're getting back. But this was actually on the floor in that little building. And we also found one of the few artifacts that came up was this stone bowl with a chip out of it. And I swear to you that that's not us hitting it with a patiche. That is an ancient break. You can still see the soil encrusted in it. We were later, later able to test this for organic residue. Uh, and it looks like there was some kind of uh, fatty acid still in the bowl itself. Uh, in that same area in D South, we also just off to the, let's see, it would be the west of the building with the fresco fragments. We found this area, um, which we're still trying to figure out what was going on here with a nice zigzag wall and a plastered floor here as well. Staircase and drain over here. The pottery dated it uh, to MB1 late down here and then MB2 up here. So it fits right into the rest. It's going to be contemporary with the palace. But what is actually going on here, we're not sure. So of course, therefore, we concluded it was ritual or religious. Uh, and we will stick with that until we actually figure out what it is. Going to the other side then, back up to D West, and orienting ourselves again around Ceremonial Hall 611 once more. We began digging, and to the north of everything, um, we found this interesting, again, kind of zigzag wall. Now, we had originally thought that this wall off to the left, where my cursor is, that that had, was the northern edge of the palace. Turns out it's not. It does continue to the north. And therefore, this there's something going on here. 
Uh, we were wondering at first if it was in fact outside and if it were a road or a curtain wall or something like that, but um, it's only one course of stones deep, just one course. And so I'm wondering if now maybe we, not, we might not have something like a raised pavement such as you see at Knossos or rather a raised walkway. So we're still in the area of the palace, but I'm wondering, we still don't know, but we decided to follow this, uh, whatever it is, road, wall, we decided to follow it out here, again, going to the west. And we started excavating in this region. Again, at the time, we thought that this was the outer western wall. So in 2011, we thought we were digging outside the palace, uh, both to the north and the west. It turned out we were mistaken in both instances. So over here to the west, as we were trying to follow that yellow brick road, as we called it, we came up here, we wanted to compare non-palatial to palatial deposits. And so we were all excited that we were outside the palace. And then all of a sudden, you can see this row of stones coming up. And as we excavated, there is that same row of stones hard up against what we had thought was the base of the um, western wall. Turned out, nope, we were still in the palace. Here is the room uh, that is plastered and note that it dips down suddenly right here and that these orthostats, which is what they are, carved rocks would, would have been absolutely beautiful back in the day. Um, they also have a step here uh, and that is going to go at the end when I come back to uh, what was mentioned uh, in the introduction, we think that this may be evidence for an earthquake that hit at the end, but I will come back to this. In any event, we didn't know that in 2011. All that we knew was that we had another plaster floor, and it turned out, in fact, that we had uh, what we called the orthostat building, because we still at the time thought it was separate and up against uh, the palace. We now know it's actually part of the palace. So very thick wall for the palace here, then our so-called orthostat building, and you can actually see the orthostats in C2 with the nice little hole in each one of them. And the idea is that you put a vertical wooden rod in there, and then onto the rods you would put um, wooden slats. Think Venetian blinds today and uh, you would essentially be able to make a wooden face for the inside of your, um, of your whatever this is, of your, your building here. Um, so the way I've always described it, at least to my parents, it's like, dad, you remember you used to have a wood line study that you did your work in, that's what this would have looked like. So it wouldn't have been a, um, a sheer rock face inside, but rather probably a wooden veneer. <clears throat> in any event, this is the first time that uh, orthostats were found in situ, anywhere at the site. Kempinski and Niemeyer had thought they were also orthostats in um, Ceremonial Hall 611, surrounding that painted floor but there is now simply soil there. Somebody removed them at some point, but here they're still in place. So we have an entranceway here, then we have a very large main room, and then we have a threshold and a back room back here. For a while, we thought maybe we were dealing with um, a temple of some sort, and that maybe that was, you know, like a holy of holies in the back, but when we excavated the back, which you can see here, even though it was a gorgeous floor made out of those same ashlar blocks, but laid face down this time and then plastered over, the only thing we found in this back room were the fragments of three storage jars. So whatever it had been used for earlier, by the end of its life, it was being used for storage back here. And you can see how they are broken up. Uh, the plaster is affected. And then off to the right here, you see how it's sloping in again 
keep that in mind because it turns out, if we're correct, those are sloping into the fissure that opened up right through the middle of the palace when the earthquake hit and everything fell in from both sides, including the stones of the back room of the palace and part of the threshold from the main room. But we'll come back to this. In the meantime, it is one of the prettiest rooms I've ever excavated. Uh, and again, you can see the plaster running right up onto the walls there. So there are parallels for these, especially on Minoan Crete, because our dowel holes, the shapes of them in the orthostats, seem to be more Minoan than they are Near Eastern. There are, of course, orthostats uh, at sites like Ebla and elsewhere, but the shape of the dowel holes is different in most of the sites in the ancient Near East, and ours seem to better conform to various sites on Crete. So again, we may have uh, a Gian influence in our palace. So just to show you where we are then, here is the so-called orthostat building. Here is what we had thought was the external wall, uh, which is no longer the external wall. And then down here to the left is um, where the original painted floor is. So you can see this is indeed the palace that keeps on giving, and it is progressing still to the west. So we wanted them to come back in the next season and continue to the west, hopeful that we would still get outside the palace and be able to finally compare uh, non-palatial deposits to palatial. So we then in the next season continued off to the west. Now this whole time we had also been uh, doing lots of sieving, especially on the floors. We had been doing um, flotation and everything else. So you see here Laurel uh, Poolman, who was uh, undergraduate at GW at the time. She's now at Johns Hopkins finishing up her PhD. Uh, and we had Nimrod Marone looking at the bones and decided that our so-called um, uh, orthostat building was uh, in fact perhaps used for feasting uh, because that's where we found a lot of the bones. So still open for negotiation, but that is our working hypothesis that they would have been eating in this region. So. Put you in perspective, this is Carberry 2013. Uh, we got our volunteers to sell out the name. Uh, and then we proceeded further to the West. So they are in fact spelling Carberry on top of that um, earlier painted floor. This right here is the orthostat building. And when we proceeded to the West, hoping to be outside the palace, we were uh, stymied once again. We are still inside the palace, but this time we hit the wine cellar. Again, very unexpected, but um, now that we think about it, it's not surprising if they're storing their wine out here, if it's next to the feasting hall out here. So it may all be connected. So again, let me take you then in 2013 to this area on the left here, where we found our first um, room full of wine jars. And we're gonna focus in on this room with the hole right in the middle. That is in fact a drain for the wine to drain out of. So this is what we found while we, uh, when we began to excavate, we actually had um, one jar appear before any of the others did. It was slightly higher up for some reason. Um, we found it about 10 days into the dig and um, realized what we might be coming down upon. So we split our team into two because we are running a field school. We wanted everyone to get training. And we also realized we had about 50 people there at the time. We couldn't get them all into this area. So um, uh, Soth came up with the idea of using something like they had used at Tel Mitna, only a bit different. Our team was split into two and half of the group dug the normal hours from 5 a.m. until 1 p.m. And the other group then dug from 2 p.m. until 8 p.m. And they alternated days. So team A didn't always have to get up for 5 a.m. Uh, on alternate days, team B did that 
Um, I will tell you that what we didn't remember though, was that the, um, the permit says that the dig directors have to be out at all times if anybody is excavating. So that meant that Asaf and I were out there from 5 a.m. to 8 p.m., which we hadn't taken into consideration. But it worked. We got basically twice as much work out of everybody without working them double. Um, and I have to tell you that excavating at 6 p.m. was absolutely gorgeous. The sun was nice. The weather was nice. Uh, I would actually do that in a heartbeat all over again. So this then, let me go back, there we go. This is uh, what it ended up looking at the end of the season. This big one right here, just underneath our, um, our sign, that was the very first one that came up. And then by the time we figured out that it was on the plaster floor, uh, it had been joined by 39 others. We got about 40 jars that uh, first season. And you can see some of them uh, we're in absolutely gorgeous shape. Uh, these are all my pictures, which I kind of liked. Um, and then Norit Goshen, who was supervising that area, is giving a lecture here to the volunteers. And this also brings always to my mind the movie, I think it was Cocoon, with everybody in their pods. In order, though, to be able to record these, we brought in a team from Haifa uh, with LIDAR. Uh, I had never realized previously that you could use LIDAR terrestrially rather than just up in you know, small Cessnas and helicopters. And these folks in a matter of three hours mapped our entire room with all of the jars still in situ, um, creating hundreds of thousands of data points such that we wound up with images like this with the different colors representing the different heights. And we were even able to um, look at and map the individual jars and measure their diameters without ever touching anything. And this turned out to be excellent uh, for two reasons. One, we had thought that each of these held about 50 liters when we were just guesstimating. But after we did the LIDAR and measured them, it turns out that each jar held about 113 liters. So more than double what we had thought. And then the second thing was when we were then um, moving these back to the lab, all of them were in pieces. They were what we would say shattered in place. They had fallen over. And then when the roof and the walls collapsed on top of them, they had all broken. But as you could see, in some of the pictures, let me go back here, um, they're all, I wouldn't call them intact, but they retain their shape for the most part. So that's why I say they shattered in place. So um, it was very good that we did the LIDAR and got the measurements because otherwise it would have been nearly impossible to figure out the capacity. We also did uh, with Andrew Coe, whom you see here on the left, uh, sampling for residue analysis, took samples from each of the jars and actually did the extraction right there um, at the kibbutz that we were staying at. It really, um, if you walked by Andrew's room, it smelled like something out of Breaking Bad. It smelled like he was running a meth lab, but he was in fact extracting the residue and then took them back to Brandeis, ran them through the gas chromatography machine and was able to identify the various acids that were in um, that were still retained by the ceramics. So um, tartaric acid, syringic acid. Uh, at that point, uh, Andrew contacted us and said, um, yeah, it's wine. Because we had been wondering, was it wine? Was it olive oil? What exactly was it? And he's like, no, um, it's pretty much red wine, like 37 out of the 40 are um, probably red wine, maybe three held white wine. But then he also said, we've got um, acids from resin, not surprising, uh, because there's no way to you know store it for long. Uh, and it seems like they're also putting in additives to make it taste better. So uh, cineol, which may be mint, could be juniper berry, could be cinnamon bark, um, also honey, 
methyl syringate, uh, and then terebinth resin, most likely. So uh, at some point, we would like to try to recreate this, though Asaf has warned me it's probably not going to taste very good. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, imagine um, if you've got Greek retsina and you've mixed it with cough syrup, that's pretty much what this would taste like. So I think if we end up ever marketing this, we might have to um, change the ingredients around slightly. But anyway, so we'll see. That's not come to pass yet. But um, we did, uh, for the first time ever, for both of us, make um, newspapers around the world. New York Times picked up on it, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Uh, my favorite was Time Magazine, which put out a little article called What Bronze Age Wine Snob Drank. Uh, and so that was kind of fun. But we also noticed, here is that room. After we took out the 40 jars, and we realized because of the way that our five by five square had been set up, that we actually had excavated another threshold right here where the red arrow is and part of the uh, southern wall here, and that we had gone into the next room because there's our bulk at the end of that square. And we realized at the end of the 2013 season that there were going to be more rooms with more jars because uh, it was just as thick on this floor as it had been out here. So when we came back in 2015, we kind of knew what was going to be in store. And sure enough, this is that same room. There's that threshold I showed you before. And this blank area, that's the area where we took up the uh, broken pottery jars, the sherds, at the end of the 2013 season because we didn't think they would survive uh, the winter when we weren't there. So you have to think back here, uh, just as thick, uh, the, the shirts. And then you can see some of the other jars. And then over here, there is actually a jar that has fallen into that next doorway and the southern wall of that room. And in the end, it turned out that there were four rooms. Uh, there's the original uh, wine cellar room back there. And then room number two, room number three. And then here we've got room number four, which actually goes underneath the British Mandate Road. So we only got a bit of that. So here's one of our GW students excavating in one room. Here's another GW student excavating in another room. Uh, Sarah Sotani, she actually just got her MA uh, in uh, forensic medicine at BU and is now going to head off hopefully to a PhD program. So we ended up getting um, pretty much four more rooms, although only bits of the fourth one, and another 70 jars. So 110 jars now, each holding about 113 liters. And we realized that this is probably not just a wine cellar. It might actually be um, uh, a little winery. Either that or this is the original party palace and this, this ruling family had an awful lot of wine uh, in at least four rooms. And in fact, with Andrew, we were able to color code and realize that there might have been a whole setup here from south up to north because the red numbers that you see here that's in the first room that we found, the wine cellar. And those are the most complete, which had both resin and additives. Some of the others further in, in the rooms further to the south had either resin or additives, but not both. So we think there might have been kind of an assembly line. But we also realized that there were more things up to the north. So we wanted to keep going up there. Hence, we came back in 2017 found more jars uh, and other objects because it turns out that next to this set of rooms further to the west is a courtyard. And in that courtyard, we found another, a number of dumps and deposits, including uh, more scarabs and little figurines. In fact, here you go, that's this, this is that same figurine. It's made out of lead and it has very good parallels up to Anatolia from the Assyrian colony period. And this will be coming out in the next issue of Basor 
In fact, I believe it's already up ahead of print on the University of Chicago Press website if you subscribe that way to Basor. Uh, for those who don't, it will be out in May or I can send you a copy of our proofs. So coming back in 2019 and wrapping up because this is the last season that we have had, uh, we went back to this region and decided to go north and opened up this area here. And of course, every time we move into a new area, we have to take out more avocado trees. We do have an agreement with the kibbutz that if we don't wanna take out too many, they will happily or not so happily do it for us. So we try to limit it to one, two or three avocado trees per season. Uh, but you can see that if we go in any of our directions, then we're going to have to take out more. And you can see here what I mean, uh, that we're expanding in all directions. So we haven't gotten there yet. And here, just to give you um, context, this is uh, what the zigzag wall up top, or maybe raised walkway, that's where that is. So we're definitely still going to go to the north in the future. So this is what we found in 2019. We are just to the north of those four uh, wine cellar rooms. And it looks like we have what we're now calling the northern storage complex as opposed to the southern. And lo and behold, in this area, we found, you guessed it, more storage jars and they hold wine as well. So we are now up to something like 150 such jars in five rooms. It literally is um, the palace that keeps on giving. Uh, and indeed, it continues to give in ways that we didn't expect. We had a team come over, uh, Philip Stockhammer uh, and his colleagues came and we went back in to the orthostat building into the plaster floor because there is uh, a new very experimental technique that has hypothesized that human DNA may bond to some of the proteins in the plaster as the workmen back then were laying the floor. And so um, the team went in, we dug out a small area uh, and they took samples from the plaster. I'll tell you right now, because of COVID, they haven't been able to run the samples. So we don't know if there's going to be DNA adhering to any of the plaster. But um, as they were doing that, uh, Steffi, Steffi Eisenman, you see her here, she called me over and said, you know, um, the floor that of the orthostat building, she said, we took samples of it, but then we also wanted to take samples below it. And did you know that there's another floor below it? And I'm like, no, we didn't know that because we never went below. We just stopped at this level. And that plaster floor was unpainted where she's kneeling. But down in the new area, that lower floor is painted. You can see it here with my scale for uh, in there. And there it is up close. We've only got this little bit, maybe 10, 15 centimeters. But we can already see that there is what looks today to be orange. Um, kind of a blackest line right here. Um, we've definitely got another painted floor. And this would be just to the west of the original ceremonial hall 611. So being good sports and not um, giving in to our curiosity, we quickly covered it up uh, and it has remained untouched. We hope to go back. We were hoping to go back this summer, but maybe 2022, but we need to raise enough money to come back with conservators that can help us excavate and preserve the floor as it comes out. Um, I think it goes the entire length and width of the main room in the orthostat building, which would be about three meters by 10 meters. Of course, we won't excavate the whole thing. We'll just excavate a part of it, but um, I'm hoping against hope that this will turn out to be another Aegean style floor, but stay tuned. We won't know that um, for a while. So the other thing that we were trying to do in, um, in 2019 then was to try to figure out uh, how the palace was destroyed because it 
looked like it was simply abandoned and people went away and never came back. But they had enough time that they cleared out the palace. Um, besides that broken stone uh, bowl that I showed you earlier, the only real artifacts that we found are the shattered um, wine vessels, wine jars. Um, we do have you know, bits and pieces of um, remnants from textile making and so on. But really this palace was um, emptied out. So we were trying to figure out what happened. Was there a natural catastrophe? Was it human? Um, there's no evidence for weapons or for bodies. Uh, there's no evidence in the, uh, in the records of, of anybody at this time for military campaigns. So um, Roe Nicholsberg and Ruti Shahak Gross took some um, microarchaeological samples. Um, we also brought in Michael Lazar to take a look at the geology of the area and realized that in fact, our palace is built right on top of a fault line. And so we think now this explains everything that we had been seeing since about 2011, including, it's kind of hard to see the black dotted line here. This is um, what we had thought was a later trench. We thought it was a much later trench, but when everything fell together, we realized when we excavated it properly, that it was in fact from the same time period and that it ran through absolutely everything. You can see it a bit better here outlined in red and it ran right through this new Northern storage room that we just found in 2019. And in fact, in that area, it was pretty clear. Um, this you can see is a wall that has fallen to the North and fallen right into this fissure. Same thing over here, a little bit harder to see, but these jars are actually rolling down the floor to the south this time into this fissure or crevice. So these jars are actually over here on the other side of that vault. So we've got evidence for things rolling from both north and falling from the south into this big fissure. And so here, remember I told you to keep an eye on this, we can now see that the stones of the back room of the orthostat building are tilting in. Here is the stepped area in the front of the orthostat building um, that we think goes with this earthquake. And here I said that the threshold between the main room and the back room in the orthostat building had also fallen in. So we think that there is a lot of evidence. Here's the fissure running right through the palace, but we've also got other things moving in different directions. And indeed in some of the walls, we can see warping uh, and in the floors as well, as if something has caused them to rise up and then fall again. So we looked around to see if there was any independent evidence for earthquakes in approximately this period. And indeed, there are a couple of candidates. So if our earthquake is one of these, then it would have hit somewhere probably about 1700 to 1650 BCE, which would work fairly well with our radiocarbon dates. So we did just publish this. It came out uh, in 2020 in um, September in plus one, if anyone wants to read it. But that for us, at least is our working hypothesis that this is why the palace and the site as a whole uh, was abandoned at this time that when the earthquake hit, they probably said, that's it, we're moving elsewhere. And it may for that matter have also affected the water table uh, and affected at least temporarily the two sources of water. So uh, we think now we're going with this earthquake hypothesis. So um, I've come to the end of my time. If anybody's interested, we have published all of this and I can send anybody who is interested the list. Here's the volume that just came out on our first couple of seasons that Brill has published. We have actually just signed a contract with them for the um, succeeding volume for the 2013 to 2019 seasons. Uh, and then we've got publications on the wine cellar 
painted plaster fragments, technological studies that Ravi Lin has been doing on the painted plaster, uh, the various rooms uh, and the floors, also the radiocarbon dating that Felix Hoffemeyer has been doing, ceramic studies that um, uh, Inbal Samet and Paula Wymack um, Barak are doing, uh, even popularizing articles in, I think these are both in Biblical Archaeology Review, the international connections economic studies, stratigraphic studies, zooarchaeological studies, uh, and then the what I would call the beginning, this is our survey, and the end, namely the earthquake. Uh, and in fact, I would normally say this end, except I know we're going back, so I would say, or is it? And with that, I thank you so much for your patience, and I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Klein, for speaking uh, uh, to us here today. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming out and joining us in this wonderful and insightful lecture. Um, I hope you all continue to have a great rest of your week. And um, best of luck, everyone. Great. Thank you all for attending. My pleasure. Thank you.